Good afternoon and welcome to EY's Accounting and Regulatory Webcast Series. My name is Kara Kengla and I will be your host for today's webcast. Today our theme is IFRS 9 Insights Ahead of Year End. We have brought together a great panel of speakers that will provide perspectives on the performance of IFRS 9 ECL during this unforeseen pandemic period and cover the expectations ahead of year end in the context of what we saw from banks in Q3 reporting. We will also touch on focus areas for 2022, such as climate risk. As we move towards year end, the global economy has already exceeded pre-pandemic levels of economic activity. However, the pandemic is far from over due to low vaccination rates in a large portion of the world. Actions by governments and central banks have helped mitigate the impact of the crisis, but as rescue packages unwind, we, will, we still do not yet know the extent of the impact. Costs continue to rise due to supply disruptions and higher commodity prices, generating upward price pressures. And the question still remains, is this temporary? The focus has shifted from the projection of an economy-wide recession to considerations of sectorial recessions with tourism and leisure industries impacted the most. Sector analysis is a clear focus of banks in terms of IFRS 9 ECL. But with this wider backdrop, it's clear that challenges and uncertainty remains. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Laura Guégan, EY's European Financial Services IFRS leader and IFRS 9 specialist. Today, she'll be presenting our Q3 benchmark and moderating the panel. And on our panel today is Sue Lloyd, Vice Chair of the IASB, Elizabeth McCall, Member of the Supervisory Board of the European Central Bank, and Rajiv Bansel, our European Stress Testing Lead and IFRS 9 Modeling Specialist. At this time, I'm gonna hand the floor over to Lore, who will start today's session with highlights of our recent bench quarterly benchmark. She will also ask Sue, Elizabeth, and Rajiv to provide perspectives throughout the discussion. As usual, the benchmark is very extensive, and the idea during the session is to draw out the most important key points. Following the webcast, I will provide you access to, to download the slides presented today, which will also include some featuring slides from our half-year benchmark to be able to show you the evolution in 2021. Without further ado, Lore, over to you. Thanks, Tara. Uh, I'm very excited to present this update with uh, Sue and Elizabeth today. So thank you very much both for being here. A few reminders on the, our analysis. So our um, sample includes 19 uh, European banks selected based on the size of loans to customers. And for some countries like the UK and France, the number of banks is larger and allows to see some country trends. It's more limited for the other countries. The banks in our sample obviously have very different business profiles and footprints, uh, which are key to understand uh, the trends. And you will find more information on this in the appendix, as mentioned by, by Tara. For this quarter, uh, in a nutshell, the trends were driven by continued improved uh, economic forecasts and risk indicators still benign. State three losses remained uh, at a historic low, historically low level but uncertainties remain, as Tara said, as support measures unwind and overlays have been maintained or increased compared to year end 2020. For this quarter, where more limited information was available, we focused mainly on ECL PL charge, additions to stage one and two allowance since the beginning of the crisis, overlays, and stage two allocation. And it's interesting to highlight that we observed three main trends amongst the banks. One group with significant ECL net releases driven by releases of stage one and two allowance after a sharp increase in 2020. A second group with close to nil or slightly negative ECL charges reflecting some releases of stage one and two offset by stage, stage three losses. And finally, a third group with more normalized levels of ECL charges, close to 2019 or slightly lower, with stage one and two allowance kept stable or slightly increased. So that's what you see on the next slides, which shows the uh, ECL charge uh, split by quarter. So you have 2020 and 2021. 
Uh, and as you can see, consistent with the first half of 21, the third quarter ECL charge is very low or negative. It's reflected in, in yellow on this graph. And you can recognize the three trends I was referring to earlier. So some significant net releases in the first nine months for the banks uh, that we've highlighted in, in blue, in the blue frame. They are mostly concentrated in the UK and the releases tend to be slightly more modest in, in Q3. In contrast, a more normalized pattern of quarterly ECL charge um, in Spain, Italy and France uh, with a, a highlighted in an orange frame. And finally, a third group of banks which have a very low or nil ECL charge uh, highlighted in green. And as we will see later, the differences are driven by the level of stage one and two releases following the differences we observed in additions to stage one and two in 2020. So this results in a year-to-date cost of risk ratios which have significantly dropped compared to 2020. This is what, what the next slides uh, show. Um, as a reminder, the cost of risk ratio is the ECL charge divided by the gross carrying amount of loans to customers. And so it allows better comparisons between banks of different sizes. Note that the 2021 ratio is annualized. Uh, based on the first nine months, which means that Q4 21 is assumed to be like the first three quarters, which of course differs from uh, the bank's forecast for the full year, but it's the, the, the way uh, to compare with the full year. The trends I just mentioned um, are even clearer on this graph actually, which also includes 2019 in dark gray as an interesting comparison. 2020 cost of risk is in white and 21 uh, annualized is in yellow. So if we focus on the UK for which we have a larger sample, we can see that after a, a spike uh, at on average 95 basis point in 2020, almost all UK banks are showing negative cost of risk levels in 2021. In Spain, Italy and France, where the level of increase in 2020 was lower, banks have a 2021 cost of risk closer to 2019. German banks are at half of the 2019 cost of risk, and the rest of the banks are split between a negative cost of risk, similar to the UK, or close to nil after a, a, an increase in 2020. So as I said, these differences in trends are driven by movement in stage one and two allowance. So this slide shows the cost of risk ratios split between stage one and two on one hand and stage three. The sample is reduced because not all banks gave the split in Q3, but it, it still shows an interesting trend. So the first bar is 2020 with S1 and S2 in white and S3 in light gray. And the second one is 2021 with stage one and two re represented in yellow and stage three in dark gray. A word of caution on the graph again, because um, we, we are annualizing the 2021 cost of risk. The level of release is not strictly comparable to the level of addition in 2020, uh, because again, we assume the fourth quarter will look like the other three. So it may overestimate a bit the level of releases for certain banks. So the impairment charge, as you can see, is mainly attributable to stage three losses, which are at a, at a low level. And in contrast with 2020, there are limited additions to stage one and two with significant releases in some banks. Q3 confirms the half year trend with more banks showing negative stage one and two cost of risk, but the releases tend to stabilize. The half-year comparison um, that we presented in our uh, last webcast where, and where we had more banks because we have more data for half-years was also showing uh, three different trends um, on S S1 and 2. Uh, the UK banks and also the Belgian banks had significant S1 and 2 releases following significant additions in 2020. In Spain, Italy and France, a number of banks still had small additions in 2021 following generally more measured increases in 2020. And the rest of the banks showed nil or small releases. So the next graph uh, represents the net additions to stage one and two allowance on a cumulative basis over 2020 and 2021. What we try to represent is how much is left compared to how much was added in 2020 in a nutshell. So the white bar represents the addition at the end of your 2020. 
and the yellow one shows what's left today. And you can see that some banks have released half of what they have they had added in 2020. And it's important to consider the amount released in comparison to the level of addition in 2020. Generally, the biggest releases were from banks that had the biggest additions in 2020. Some differences in past can be explained to a certain extent by different dynamics of the pandemic in the different countries, different timings, different magnitude, different levels of lockdowns and support measures. And there were also various levels of optimism throughout the crisis. But but they also seem to uh, reveal different levels of model responsiveness to the crisis and different ways to project forward-looking information and incorporate it uh, into the model. Um, another way to compare um, the, uh, where banks are now after removing the volatility effect is to add up the movements observed in 2020 and 2021, both the additions and the releases, and then average them over two years. And this is what we've done here on this graph, where we reflect this average for both 2020 and 21. And it provides a clearer picture of how banks compare on the level of additions uh, to uh, ECL allowance. And it shows that the levels of additions overall are more homogeneous compared to 2019 across the banks than the year-on-year -year trends may suggest. Uh, and for instance, if you uh, uh, take uh, the UK and France as two contrasting examples, because uh, again, we have a, a larger number of banks in these two, for these two countries, um, we, we saw a very sharp increase in the UK followed by significant rele releases, while the increase was more measured in France with no release and even some additions in, in, in 2021. Um, and in the end, the level of increase compared to 2019 is, is uh, um, higher um, in France. So, of course, these trends need to be considered in the light of different business mix and footprints, but it, it, it sheds an interesting light on, on how the, the model wa was applied. And actually, it brings me to my first question to our um, uh, panelists, and I, I will start with uh, Sue. Um, so th these trends reveal some diversity in how banks have reflected uh, such a volatile and uncertain environment in their IFRS 9 allowance. Uh, some banks increased more and, and more quickly and released more afterwards. Others ha had a, more, a steadier pattern of increase. Are you surprised by that? And, and, uh, or do you rather see it as inherent to, to, to the model? It's a, it's a good question, and it's a really interesting set of data. I think it's going to be fantastic to have this when we do the post-implementation review. I think it's hard to tell uh, whether or not I am surprised when I, when I look at these numbers. In the first instance, if you think about what people are being asked to do, they're being asked to estimate expected credit losses in, a, a, in an incredibly uncertain environment with no real precedent for the pandemic or the level of government support. So we've asked people to do something very difficult and we're asking for management's expectations. And so do we expect everybody to get to the same answer? I think the short answer is no. So I'm probably not surprised that there are differences in outcomes and that in itself doesn't make me think, you know, oh my goodness, something's wrong. But what I think is particularly interesting to me when I look at the um, analysis is the apparent country differences. And I think it's going to be really interesting for us to understand what's driving that. Is it something that is a, a sort of objective difference in, in portfolios and geographic exposures or something like that? Is it because different regulators have done different things in different jurisdictions, which is causing differences in, in, out, um, in, in outcomes? Or is there actually a difference in understanding of what people are being think they're being asked to do? And it's that last one that would concern me as a standard setter. Uh, the other ones are, you know, perhaps more understandable. And so it will be really a deep dive to decide whether or not we're really surprised, let alone whether we're worried or pleased. Thanks. And, and, and we know that diversity in application is an, an area of concern for, for the uh, ECB, obviously. So, uh, Elizabeth, can, can you share your observations on this? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, and, and just to, to start with the surprise factor, I mean, uh, I think that it, it, it goes without saying that the COVID-19 and all of the uncertainties that were created around that 
um, are unprecedented, historic, and exceptionally large. And so some divergence in the IFRS 9 provisioning estimates across banks is, is just inevitable. And that we, we, I have to say, we would expect that at the outset of the crisis. And while we're fully respecting the primary responsibility of the management boards of banks to provide accurate assessments of future credit losses, it's very important that we see the practices start to converge, and that allows for better peer analyses like you're doing today, which I compliment you on, and that creates more transparency on asset quality. And that is uh, very, very important for uh, the, the market transparency that is needed for investability in Euro banks. Um, the benchmarking in the area of IFRS 9 is something that we see remains um, challenging in terms of provisioning, but we also see some positives. We've increasingly seen banks harmonizing and converging um, since the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, and I'll talk about this a, a little bit later, but um, we have issued a fair amount of guidance to try to drive some of that convergence and some of the best practices in the provisioning. And so just a couple of observations. First, um, we see that the baseline scenarios for 2021 applied by the banks are more strongly anchored in the macroeconomic projections of the ECB and the national central banks. And we're not seeing uh, so much um, optimism, overly optimistic, highly hypothetical scenarios. And so we've got a, a good anchor that we see broadly speaking. And second, uh, banks are, are basing their accounting provisions on more robust methodologies. And compared with pre-pandemic years, the probability of default models used by the banks for provisioning have become less sensitive to highly judgmental and uncertain GDP growth expectations. And these don't have as much accounting rele relevance in the longer term horizons. Third, having noticed some delays in the IFRS 9 stage adjustments in 2020, and despite a significant increase in credit risk, we are recommending that banks consider a threefold increase in the probability of default of an obligor as a hard backstop measure to transfer exposures from stage one to stage two. And although we see convergence of, of provisioning practice practices as a step forward uh, towards implementing IFRS 9, we don't think it's time to be complacent. Um, we're still seeing a wide uh, variation in stage three classifications across the banks. So there's a few observations for you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Rajiv, maybe can you comment on, on the on the responsiveness of the UK banks uh, model and, and how it, has the PRA approached the consistency of, of uh, UK banks IFRS 9 provisioning? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Law. Um, I, I think what you can clearly see from the chart is actually how sensitive the modeling framework um, used by the UK banks actually are both to the prevailing and the expected future economic conditions, which is what is very much driving that kind of ramp up in stage stage one, stage two provisions, and that, that kind of ramping down as, as well. Um, and, and, and that was a feature that we were kind of well aware of as IFRS 9 was, 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 was going live and over the past, past few years as well. I, th I think um, one thing that has, I know you're going to kind of cover this a little bit later on, is there has been some level of compensation, I think, in the UK market with the use of overlays and adjustments, but that, but that clearly, from, from the analysis that you presented, hasn't been enough necessary to, to taper the volatility compared to compared to the rest of Europe, at least. Um, in terms of the consistency from, from the PRA, I think they, they've very much been driving it through three different lenses. Um, firstly is the number of scenarios. Um, and and to, to the point that Elizabeth was making earlier, anchoring it to a central Bank of England scenario and then kind of building scenarios off the back of that has, has, has been a, a key kind of driver for them. Um, secondly is uh, the scenario weighting as well. So one, the number of scenarios and anchoring. Second is how do you weight those scenarios and creating some consistency around that. And third is, is staging criteria. So, so very much um, similar to the ECB aligning that quantitative threshold across the market has, has, has been a real push from, from the regulator. And I think that they're, they're definitely making strides with that as well. Thank you, Rajiv. So we, we cannot speak about trends without mentioning overlays. So this graph shows the total amount of overlays disclosed by banks at year end uh, 2020 in wide 
in white, sorry, uh, at the end of Q1, Q2, Q3. So we were monitoring the evolution of, of overlays uh, quite uh, closely during all quarters. Um, note that this slide is based on, on what banks disclosed, so the comparison depend, uh, depends on the level of transparency. And as you can see, overlays become very, became very significant in 2020, and they have continued to increase in 2021. The, the numbers were actually very small when disclosed in, in 2019 compared to what we have now. And so through the pandemic, overlays were used to adjust the models, reflect the impact of the level of government support measures, and also to differentiate the severity of the crisis for different sectors. And generally now, banks deem that modeled releases are not entirely representative of the underlying risks as defaults may still be masked by support schemes. And so the modeled releases are therefore partly, partly offset by an increase in management overlays. Additional overlays were also booked on high risk exposures and vulnerable sectors. And so these amounts include both post model adjustments and management overlays, but we see a trend towards less model adjustments and more uncertainty overlays. The next graph shows the proportion uh, that overlays represent in comparison to the total size of stage one and stage two ECL allowance, because overlays generally relate to performing exposures. We, uh, this is a more meaningful ratio. And as you can see, the proportions remain very high and have sometimes increased significantly with levels, uh, an average uh, proportion at 40%. And this is due to a mixed effect of a decrease in ECL balance and an increase in, in amounts of overlay. According to banks' disclosures, releases are not expected until late 21 or 2022, when banks have a better visibility on the actual impacts of the wind, wind down of support measures. Which brings me to my second question to, to the panelists, and, and I will uh, start uh, with um, Sue again. So the, the use of overlays was something that the ISB mentioned very early when, when um, in March 2020, when uh, they, they released uh, um, some uh, guidance in the context of, of COVID. What's your view on the use of overlays as reflected in, in these trends today? Yeah, this is an interesting area, and you're right that when we came out uh, early on in the crisis with some observations on the application of IFRS 9, we mentioned the role of overlays. And consistent with that, I can I can see entirely why overlays are still a fairly big deal in the context of COVID-19, because as I understand it, given that we've got very, very low sort of, um, levels of actual uh, defaults, um, probably because of the level of government support, what's coming out of models may seem quite low relative to what management really feel is, is the appropriate picture. And IFRS 9 is asking people to measure expected credit losses that meet management's expectations about 12 month and lifetime allowances. And so if they need to adjust, that's the right thing to do, uh, which I think which I think is, um, which is, um, so that's appropriate. Um, but having said that, just, just a, just a couple of things. I think um, what's important to remember is that IFRS 9 doesn't just say make sure that your allowance balance is big enough. It asks you to meet particular measurement uh, requirements, the 12 months and the, and, the, and the lifetime. It also asks you to make sure things are appropriately allocated between stages. So I think it's really important that people don't lose sight of that, that there's still is a measurement objective. These aren't general provisions. These are something with a more specific uh, character and the staging is really important. It's not enough to say the allowances are big enough. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. So I hope people are remembering that when they're doing their overlays. The other thing is, even though I can understand why people need to use overlays to meet the requirements of IFRS 9 in this difficult environment, once I start to see numbers of 40 percent um, on average, that's a big, big number. And, and I think for me, that really just highlights that this, the question of governance and really having as, um, as specific an objective as possible, a basis for what the allowance for the, what those overlays are, to support the unwinding of those at some point as well, it's going to be really, really important to, to really ensure we've got the right level of robustness in these numbers so it just doesn't just become a big, you know, cookie jar to use a pejorative term. Mm 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, Elizabeth, what are your observations on, on the use of overlays as, as reflected on, on these graphs? Thank you. Thank you. I, I couldn't agree more with um, almost everything Sue said. Um, you know, look, it's a situation where um, all of the historical data that the models are built on um, really is completely um, divergent from the actual experience that we have during the pandemic. So um, it's, it's one, not a surprise that we needed to uh, see the banks using overlays in order to make model adjustments um, in this historic, unprecedented um, uh, health crisis that has resulted in such a significant um, also financial and overall economy crisis. So, um, so it, overlays are a good thing to, to start to get it right in terms of what the outputs are. Um, but then, you know, we, we started to recommend to the banks that they should use uh, overlays um, and uh, they should use that in particular for the staging, because this is especially where we saw that the models were not um, accurately reflecting true credit risk exposures. Um, but, you know, there's a caution here as well. Um, and that is that, you know, when the overlays are um, more important than the models themselves and they start replacing the overall models and they start to look like post model adjustments that were being made without, and Sue said it, without um, strong governance and um, some science about what the basis of the overlay is, then we start getting concerned about provisioning governance and, and then um, also accuracy of the true underlying credit picture, especially through the staging of the classifications. So, um, you know, we would look to see that overlays should start to be um, quite monitored. We expect our joint supervisory teams to be looking very carefully during 2022 about the governance on overlays, the, the foundations of the overlays, the use of the overlays. I would say if they need to be used, that's better than uh, not using them. But we want to make sure that they start to look uh, much more scientific in their, in their development, in their foundation. Thank you. Brajiv, any comment to add um, on, on the, the, the approach the PRA had on, on overlays? Because as we saw, it's also something which is very prominent um, at UK banks. Yeah, um, well, I, I think it's it's very similar to what, what Sue and Elizabeth have just uh, talked through. From, from a PRA perspective, they see the importance of um, overlays and you know, as long as they're there for a specific reason, which cannot be modelled. Where the PRA has really challenged uh, the UK banks is, is in two areas. One is where there's been persistent overlays for known model limitations with no immediate plan to remediate. They really want to see a remediation plan put into place and essentially removing those overlays and bringing them into the model, at least having a plan that they can clearly see that going into the model. I think that the second area of challenge, um, and given how kind of prevalent overlays have been over the past 12 to 18 months, is that there's a clear process um, that banks have for identifying and then measuring the size of overlays. And then there, there is that governance that sits around that. But they very much called out the role of second line challenge and having that evidence based as well. So. Um, their focus is very much second line, clear process, strong governance, and where models, where overlays are used for um, essentially known model limitations, banks need to now start removing that through proper remediation plans. Um, the other thing that the, the PRA d does actually do is they do invite a, a small number of UK banks to, to, to actually come in and informally discuss the, the provisioning plans uh, ahead of any publication dates. And I'm sure there is where that the UK regulator gets a sense of where the industry needs overlays potentially because of specific, uh, more systemic reasons which you can't necessarily model, and where they they are, you know, essentially overlays for model deficiencies, and and that's where I'm sure there's, there's probably some healthy debate with the regulator and and individual banks. Thanks, Rajiv. I would, I would uh, now like to show the um, other key uh, indicator that we are monitoring, which is stage two classification. 
Um, similarly to default classification, it's a reflection of the bank's ability to identify the deterioration of credit risk and find individual indicators or collective ones to capture the borrowers which have deteriorated. And this is well known uh, that uh, this, this was a challenge since the beginning of the crisis, as usual risk indicators tend to be muted by support measures. So on this slide, you can see the proportion of stage two loans out of the total performing loans. So we've removed uh, non-performing loans from the, the ratio. Um, and at half year 2021, this is the picture you have now because we had more data, uh, stage two loans had remained broadly stable compared to year end, following, of course, um, a, a sharp increase in 2020. I say a sharp increase, but actually the level of increase was quite uh, widely dispersed. Um, and again, the wide dispersion of increase in 2020 reflected various ways to incorporate in the stage classification forward-looking information and high uncertainties. Some banks showed a high sensitivity to the sharp deterioration uh, in the macroeconomic environment, while others had a, a slower effect on stage classification. And at half year, uh, some decreases were driven by the improved economic outlook, which reduces the PDs, which drives the stage allocation. And we also observed some transfers back to stage one for sectors deemed less vulnerable after several months. Um, and, and more significant reductions were observed at half year for the banks which increased the most in 2020. So we have provided here on the next slide the update uh, for Q3, but you, again, you have less banks because this is not a data which is as widely available in Q3. And Q3 confirms the half year trend uh, with showing slight decreases. Uh, and most banks stress that the, the material decrease in larger scale moratoria and the overall good performance of expired moratoria is still there, but they also stress that uncertainties uh, remain. And so on, on that, I would like to uh, turn again to our um, panelists, and I, I will start with you, uh, Elizabeth. The very unusual features of this crisis forced the banks to adjust their risk monitoring approaches. And can you tell us how, how banks have managed to meet the ECB expectations uh, in this context and, and which are the main areas of, of weaknesses or improvement? This is an important question. And I think here, um, you know, we have a lot of lessons learned um, from the last financial crisis that um, we, we were able to enter into this crisis with those very much um, front of mind. So right from the start, we understood the importance of making sure that the banks had strong credit risk controls in place and that they would avoid building up non-performing loans on their balance sheets because we know, we know the, the, the movie there that um, large um, buildup of NPL loans provides a, a drag on the bank itself and the, and the overall economy as a whole, especially as we look forward to the recovery. So we know that having accurate evaluation and having asset quality transparency is, is critical for maintaining trust in the banking sector. So this was paramount in our minds as we started uh, this pandemic crisis. Having said that, um, the pandemic, and, and, and Sue and Rajiv have said this, Laura, you as well, um, that the pandemic is unique for um, presenting particular challenges to managing credit risk. And the public support measures are um, utterly crucial for the cushioning of the economy that has taken place. Um, and uh, you know, we need to make sure they remain in place while they're needed, while look, lockdowns are happening, having an effect on the overall economy. But we also have to recognize that um, they can have a masking effect on the true underlying credit worthiness. And so having very strong credit risk management practices in place, especially for banks that didn't have um, large NPL build up the last time, and, and that might be counterintuitive, but it's the banks that really went through the crisis last time that have built the plumbing in their, um, in their uh, credit risk management practices and their governance practices to understand how to um, have early warning indicators in place about um, uh, deteriorating credit risk and how important that is and how to manage it and restructure. So we uh, started um, communicating very strongly with the industry. We sent a letter in April of 2020 with guidance about uh, mitigating volatility in regulatory capital and the financial statements. 
We wrote again uh, with a wake up call to the banks in July of 2020 about um, acting early to prevent buildup of losses by enhancing operational capacity for managing any surge in arrears and for um, really managing um, restructurings early on. And then in December, uh, we sent a letter to our banks as well, and we asked them to improve the identification and the measurement of credit risk. And we, uh, in a very detailed way, asked them to look very carefully at forbearance flagging, at unlikely to pay assessments, and at the IFRS 9 staging of loans and the provisioning. And then we did a, a deep dive across the industry, um, and we published some of those outcomes in July. And we saw some good practices, um, so, some good news, and we also saw some areas where there were deficiencies. And so just quickly, the good news was that, broadly speaking, we found that banks were compliant with our expectations. Very broadly speaking, we saw some good practices in place, um, especially with respect to client analysis on, on unlikely to pay assessments and, and performing granular forecasting. But um, in terms of deficiencies, we saw um, a lag, if I can call it that, in flagging forbearance correctly. And we observed a significant number of banks were not including all of the criteria relevant for effectively identifying financial difficulties. And these might have been um, uh, for loans where there was deterioration occurring even before we entered into the crisis. And uh, third, we came across banks that were failing to collect new information about their unlikely to pay assessments. And we saw cases where appropriate unlikely to pay assessment is being performed, but it wasn't being translated into a non-performing loan classification accurately. And then we saw um, varying examples of loans being kept in stage one rather than being transferred to stage two, even though there would be evidence in that loan of a significant increase in credit risk. So um, wide variety of, of practices and uh, we've We've um, identified credit risk as a supervisory priority, also going into 2022, and we have a very robust dialogue with, uh, with our banks about managing credit risk in the most transparent and accurate way. Thanks, Elizabeth. And a, a quick question for, for you, Sue. So the, the, the stage transfer has been a, an area of discussion, in particular with, with uh, uh, supervisors and how the collective approach designed in IFRS 9 was applied on, on, or not applied enough by, by banks. Um, do you feel that the, uh, the, the, the tool, in a way, designed in IFRS 9 well, were well understood in that context? This for me is probably the most challenging area when you have conversations with people because I feel like it doesn't take very long at all before people end up speaking at cross purposes. Um, because I think there's an expectation sometimes that whole big portfolios might move as a as a as a block to stage two. Uh, whereas I think sometimes the banks think about things in a more um, they try and, and find common pockets within portfolios and look at those more closely rather than moving bigger groups across. And it's a little bit hard for me to tell based on those discussions whether, you know, which approach is, is appropriate or not um, in terms of capturing all significant increases in credit risk. So for, for me, this is going to be a particular area that we'll be interested in when we get to the post-implementation review because I think um, at a high level, this is one area where we fairly consistently hear you know concerns being raised about whether or not the collective assessments are really being done in the right way um so that's going to be an area to look at so i'm sitting on the fence with my response to, other than to say it's really important because when you have the the covid situation where we knew that the normal delinquency type information just wasn't going to work so well because people had payment holidays and all of the support measures are in place you do need to profoundly change the way you do things. I think people did try to find new methods. That would be my main takeaway. But whether it was really fully in the spirit of what IFRS 9 might intend, I think we need to look deeper. Yeah, agreed. And I think it took also some time uh, for banks to adjust and, and typically the uh, EBA um, report, which was released today, highlights that maybe the uh, the collective approaches were not applied widely enough. And I, and I think that the fact that um, these observations are also, were also made uh, uh, in, in the middle of the crisis um, reveals that uh, in, in some cases it took some time to implement, I would say, uh, additional or, or more collective approaches compared to what is applied on a business as usual basis.
Um, so I would now like to consider the outlook. So this is the picture of uh, coverage ratios for performing exposures. And again, it's something which we observed at half year because we don't have the data to update it, but it shows the uh, different levels of volatility and the kind of bell curves that what we observe on the coverage ratios for uh, non-performing exposures uh, at certain banks. Generally, when um, in their Q3 uh, publications, uh, the banks had a more uh, optimistic outlook for the full year 2021. Uh, so typically, most UK banks now project a net release for the full year uh, 2021. References made to current consensus economics and default experience. Um, and ECL charges are expected to remain below historical levels in coming quarters. In other countries, the trends vary more, but generally tend towards a normalization. And so that brings me to uh, my next question to, to you, Elizabeth. So we see uh, an improvement in banks' outlooks, and uh, but ha um, what are the main areas of supervisory concerns, and how does that compare to, to uh, uh, the uh, ECB's uh, outlook, I would say? Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, the first thing I would say is that um, many European governments are tightening social distancing measures again. We have to recognize that. And so we're in a period where there remains a great deal of uncertainty about the impact and the timing of um, really emerging completely from the COVID-19 crisis. And if you wouldn't mind um, putting a slide up for me, I'll um, share some uh, observations. Thank you. Um, so here, um, uh, this is just some data that we've collected. And if you, if you look at some of the risk levels um, that we would monitor, we're observing some positive signs. And we see the NPL ratio continuing to decline. It's at 2.3% at the end of June of 2021. Um, and that's not just a, a, a phenomenon that's uh, in the ratio. It's also, a, you can see it on the left-hand side, in the absolute levels of the NPLs that we're seeing. Um, on the right-hand side, we also see uh, relatively low new NPL inflows in the first half of 2021, and that signals some good news as well. But um, I would say we're not um, looking for cause for celebration uh, too soon because we, you know, we know that the real impact of the crisis may be masked by the support measures, and we know that we're facing um, additional lockdowns in different countries across Europe right now. So the true uh, economic picture is not completely known. Um, there are some warning signs. And um, if you will turn to the next slide, um, we're closely monitoring some of the early indicators. And uh, before I, I just to touch on the slide, one indicator I would mention is the forbearance rate, which has increased substantially from 1.65% in the fourth quarter of 2020 to 1.9% in the second quarter of 2021. And that's across most countries. So that's a factor um, might be a, a good early warning indicator of some underlying um, credit deterioration. And second, in looking at the slide, if you delve a little bit deeper into the share of the stage two loans that are shown on the left-hand side, you see a gradual increase in the stage two ratio to 8.6%. And that's driven mainly by a reduction in the exposures that are, are not covered by COVID-19 support measures. And the share of stage two exposures that benefited from EBA moratoria or public guarantees are still increasing, suggesting that these exposures are carrying more inherent risk. Banks are um, indicating that uh, there is more inherent risk there. And lastly, um, impairments that are booked in the second half of 2021, and this is on the right-hand side of the chart, decreased by 40% as compared with the same period in 2020. And so this is a trend um, also to, to, uh, to think about in terms of early warning indicator. Thank you. Thank you. And, and if, um, if we look, I would say, beyond the, the risks inherent in the, the, uh, the current uh, crisis, um, Andrea and Ria in an interview last week mentioned that the horizon of risk may now be a matter of years rather than months. And, and so is the threat of a post-pandemic surge in NPLs being gradually replaced by the perspective of a more gradual emergence of credit losses as a result of an unusual recovery or uh, also a profoundly changed new normal? Um, and where do you see the potential for buildup of risks um, going forward? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, and, you know, first of all, our main priority going into 2022 is that the banks emerge healthy 
from the pandemic. And interestingly here, and this is where um, our chair was focusing on this, you know, we, we, we did not see the cliff effects that uh, we um, feared would be um, would be a result of the pandemic. And, you know, that has to do with many things, especially um, the continuance of the public support, the co continued cushioning, et cetera. Um, but, you know, the, the avoidance of this cliff effect, and this is where I think thinking about this in terms of years is, is, is perfectly appropriate, um, we may see a longer term um, picture on credit risk management that um, shows deterioration over a period of time. So um, it means that our banks are, are, are being observed very carefully by our JSTs with respect to how they have developed their credit risk management and they understand what the mitigation of credit risk is and they're properly reporting uh, what that real credit risk exposure is. We are asking the banks to um, really look very carefully at exposures to certain sectors um, where certain sectors were hit earlier on, um, restaurants, hospitality, food, agriculture. Um, we have seen an emergence from that over the summer months. Um, but it's a, you know, then, then you have other issues uh, coming up, chips come to mind, autom automotive, et cetera. So this is uh, very important to continue to monitor closely um, vulnerable sectors. And then last, very broadly, we're, you know, we're concerned about um, risks that are, are hidden, um, sort of just below the surface. We see a large increase in leveraged loans. Um, we see a, a, a search for yield on the part of banks because of low interest rates environments and looking for their profitability. Are there situations um, occurring, structured credit risk, market risk that um, in derivative products that sits on the books of banks that um, imitates credit risk um, because there is a, um, you know, there's a, a great growth in leverage globally and what sort of risk is that presenting overall? Thank you very much. I, will, I would now uh, like to touch uh, a word on disclosures. Um, the, the, sorry, I'm jumping to the slide. So we have here summarized what the uh, ESMA uh, um, uh, highlighted in their uh, enforcement uh, priorities. And disclosures clearly has become a, a, a critical uh, um, thing for, uh, for banks and, and to, in order to, to understand and compare how the ECL is uh, evolving. And so the, uh, these are the main uh, themes and we, we recognize the, the, key, the key areas of concern, management overlays, SICR forward looking, and, and uh, the UK regulators have also have had a very uh, active approach to uh, the disclosures and how they can be improved and made more uh, consistent. Um, so in, in um, being able to compare uh, the approaches became critical, but at the same time, even though the quality of disclosure has, has improved, it, it has proved very difficult to compare banks in a meaningful way at an asset class way and uh, level and also monitoring uh, key um, uh, performance indicators, I would say, uh, regarding IFRS 9. So it remains very challenging to compare. Uh, and there is a wide diversity in practice scope, format, and granularity. So, Sue, I was interested to, to hear, I mean, at a time where the ISB is working on a project disclosure requirements uh, in IFRS standards and, and working on a pilot approach, what could be the lessons learned from the IFRS 9 ECL experience? This is something we're watching very closely, uh, both uh, preparing for the post-implementation review of the ECL model, which we agreed last week, actually, we're going to start in the second half next year, but also because of this disclosure project that we're, we're looking at. And I think overall, in conversations I've had with investors, they've been quite frustrated in terms of really feeling that they can understand what's behind the ECL projections and really make comparisons between um, banks, which, which is disappointing as somebody who is very closely um, involved in, in coming up with that disclosure package. I think it's inherently challenging for IFRS 9 because by design, it is management's expectations. We built the model so that banks could use the way that they manage credit risk as a basis for applying the model and they manage credit differently. So that's going to come through as well. And we want people to be forward looking. So there's a lot of judgment and differences there as well. So those th that's, a, that's a hard thing to explain in a comparable way, just as a, as a general proposition. 
But then if I get back to what you're getting at, which is sort of the, you know, what does it mean for disclosures more generally? I think there's two things that it's interesting for us to think about. One is that um, we've got this idea in IFRS 7, which accompanies these um, requirements, that says management is required to provide information that enables particular things to be understood. So the idea was management should step back and look at the package and, if necessary, provide extra information to, to achieve that. So one thing we will want to dig into more, which is relevant for um, for um, the Disclosure Initiative project, is whether people really took that objective approach to heart and, and ran with it or not. The second is whether um, this idea that we've got in, in the standard, which basically allows some flexibility in terms of what exactly you do to package the disclosures that are provided. So it's not particular templates, it's rather information about particular things and you are allowed to provide that in different ways. Did that make it more difficult actually for investors to make comparisons? So is is is, is that something we should not do in the future? Um, and, and so I think it's a really, really important set of information actually for us for that disclosure project as well as for the IFRS 9 post-implementation review. Thank you. Yeah, I think a template is a key, a key, key topic. Um, um, I see the time is flying. Maybe Tara, we we, we could now touch on yes. climate. Which we... Yeah, thank you, Laura. And thank you. Thank you, everybody. I think there were some really great points on, on looking back at the benchmark and some good uh, observations about how we move forward. We wanted to now shift the gears a little bit and talk about climate risk, a very, very important topic. And I wanted to start off with a, a question to Elizabeth. Um, earlier this week, we saw the ECB release a statement saying the banks must accelerate their efforts to tackle climate risk um, after, after you published the, the guide uh, last year in November on how banks should manage and disclose such risks. Can you tell us a bit about the ECB timeline and the next milestones? Sure, um, and, and I'd recommend if, if you haven't had a chance to look, we published a, um, a, a big report just two days ago about our uh, bottom-up uh, view in looking at our institutions. And going into 2022, um, we're going to conduct a bottom-up stress test. This follows on the economy-wide stress test that was already um, uh, published uh, back in September. Um, but I think you'll find um, the information that we're sharing with the market in the report published two days ago um, very useful. We had 112 significant institutions um, conduct a self-assessment and give us their picture of their um, situation as we go into the stress test. And Interestingly, none of the institutions are close to fully aligning their practices with supervisory expectations. This is self-reported. Um, virtually all the institutions that uh, performed a materiality assessment expect that um, these risks coming from climate and environment risk will have a material impact on their risk profile going forward. Um, I won't take you through all of the observations, um, but just a few highlights. Um, most of the banks um, indicate a blind spot for physical risks and other environmental risk drivers in terms of their visibility into uh, what's happening. Um, we put forward a set of good practices also that banks are, are starting to implement in looking at their risk appetite statements and their governance processes to have visibility and escalation into this, this risk. Um, and, uh, but, you know, institutions have started paving the way, but the pace of progress is, is quite slow. So we expect that this stress test that we will conduct next year will be um, a very important uh, exercise to uh, raising the awareness of the clear and present risk on bank balance sheets. Um, we will not be um, translating the, the stress test into uh, an impact on capital next year. Uh, we've committed that that's not the, not the, not the case. We really want to see that the data uh, becomes much more robust and that institutions become much more um, aware of the risk that they have. There's the transition risk. Um, with what's happening across the market as um, more investment uh, in green um, in green uh, uh, companies is taking place um, and de disinvestment in non-green companies is taking place. So that has a market effect. There's also the physical effect on their operations. And there's what I would call transmission effect, which is, um, you know, the, all of these factors coming together and having a prudential impact on the bank itself and the balance sheet. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I think uh, it was a very, the ECB's report was very interesting. So I do urge people that haven't seen that to, to have a look, um, considering the, the, looking at the focus areas. So in our, in our last few minutes, I wanted to ask Sue, um, during, during COP, it was the, the IFRS Foundation announced the creation of the IWSB. Um, there's a lot, of course, a lot going on in, in, this, in this domain. Can you tell us the priorities of the IWSB and how it'll affect banks and IFRS 9? Sure. So the IWSB, the International Sustainability Standards Board, is going to be a sister board sitting next to the International Accounting Standards Board and tasked with um, writing standards that would require information to be disclosed about sustainability-related risks and opportunities. So the first thing to say is it's separate to the work of the IASB. So the IASB would continue to focus on the financial statements, the primary financial statements and the notes, and the IWSB will be looking, about, looking at note disclosures in documents such as management commentary or, or those types of documents outside the financial statements. Um, so I'm a member of our technical readiness working group that's been doing some work to come up with a set of recommendations for the new board. So I have to stress these are recommendations. The board hasn't been appointed yet and they need to make their own technical decisions. But the recommendations of the technical readiness working group are that the first two things that the new board would work on are a general requirements document and a climate document. And there's example prototypes on the foundation's website that give you an idea of what's proposed. It's a draft uh, set of requirements. So looking at those, um, the general requirements uh, prototype would require all companies, so including banks, but all companies to provide uh, all material information about their sustainability risks and opportunities that are material to investors. So it's an investor focus like the IASB. And then the specific topic standard, if you like, that is um, expected to be worked on first is climate. And so there's a climate prototype on our website as well. So it would affect banks like all companies in terms of providing information about climate risk, looking at um, governance, looking at the strategy of the organization to look after climate risk, looking at um, risk management of climate risk, and then targets and metrics. So it would be looking both at the direct climate effects, if you like, of the bank, plus its exposures through things like its um, loan portfolio. So an important document to look at. But you asked, Tara, you know, what effect does it have on IFRS 9? And the short answer is because the IWSB is looking at disclosures outside the financial statements and the IASB continues to be focused on the financial statements, there's no direct consequence to IFRS 9 as such. So it continues to be the case that, consistent with the education guidance that we put out last year, if uh, expected credit losses are going to arise as a result of credit risk, you already have to take that into account, applying the requirements in IFRS 9. It requires you to capture all expected credit losses, no matter what causes them. That could be climate. That continues to be the case. So I think the only sort of link in, in relation to expected credit losses that, that I could possibly see with the IWSB is that to the extent that companies are required to start thinking about scenario analysis, if they're applying the IWSB's climate document, that would be a, you know, a methodology and method that might be helpful to inform how you think about measuring expected credit losses. But it's not like a direct link. It's just a, you know, a common set of information that might be a useful uh, source for thinking. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you very much for that. I, I know this is a topic we're going to continue to discuss uh, for, for, many, for many years to come. So first of all, thank you all very much for your insights. And a huge thank you to Sue and Elizabeth for joining us today. Really, really great perspectives. There was a lot of questions we couldn't get to and that we'll, we'll, Laura and I will try to come back to them after. Our next webcast is in March after, after year-end reporting. Um, please look at the survey for us and, uh, and give us some feedback. Please do reach out to me, Laura, Rajiv, or your EY contact for perspectives. Thank you very much for your participation today. This concludes our webcast.